Today we're here to take a look at the ASRock X299 Extreme 4. X299 on a budget, I think. It should be the subtitle for this video. X299 and budget, really, I mean, I know Intel has the four core CPUs, the KB Lake based CPUs for the X299 socket, but I, I personally, I don't see the value. This motherboard, it's a very, very affordable X299 motherboard. It's one of the least expensive X299 motherboards that you can get. And I think it is an ideal motherboard for the 6, 8, 10, maybe 12 core CPUs. If you look at it on paper, you know, it looks pretty good. But some compromises have been made in order to get this motherboard to, you know, basically be at the price point that it is. That's not to say that it's, you know, crappy or that they've uh, under, you know, underbought components or whatever, I think it's perfectly fine. Even for overclocking, even overclocking a 10 core i9-7900X, my CPU that I can hit five gigahertz at, I was able to hit five gigahertz. The VRM solution did require active cooling. That's one of the compromises. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. One of the other compromises is the PCI Express connectivity. And that's really the cost savings that comes in here. Supporting the 16 PCI Express lane, four core CPUs, all the way up to the, you know, massive 40, 44 lane CPUs, well, depending on how you count, um, you would normally have to have a lot of PCI Express switches. But this motherboard eschews that. You don't, you don't really have anything. In fact, there's only two CPU slots that are connected directly to the CPU. The other ones actually go through the PCH, through the chipset. So there's a three by 16 slots, two armored reinforced slots. Those will work great with graphics cards or high speed peripherals, anything that you might need to run. Those can run it by 16, you know, by 16 by eight, whatever. The other by 16 slot at the bottom is PCI Express by four electrically, and that's connected through the chipset. There are two M.2, both of those are connected through the chipset, and two PCI Express by one, both of those are connected through the chipset as well. So really, that's your major cost savings. Now let's talk a little bit more about the VRM, the VRM solution. The VRM solution has a really, really beefy heat pipe. And the reason for that is because these are what are called dual stacked MOSFETs from Fairchild Semiconductor. Usually I don't like to get into the super technical details of the MOSFETs. I just want to tell you, you know, can you overclock with this? How much can you push this? What actually makes sense in terms of like being able to run this motherboard at five gigahertz or 4.5 gigahertz or whatever. If you pull the spec sheet from these MOSFETs, you can push 56 amps through them, but only at 25 degrees C. At 100 degrees C, you're in a situation where the heat from the component degrades it really fast and they're only rated for about 25, 26 amps at 100 degrees C. Now, I don't know about you, but even if I'm running inner seal, 60 amp, super top of the line power regulation circuitry, I still don't want it to run at 100 degrees C. And that's just good, that's just smart money. That's just good business. And as we all know, heat is the enemy of electronics. And the cooler that you can get your electronics to run, the better off you'll be. So they added a heat pipe to try to keep those Fairchild Semiconductor VRMs under control. So this is actually a beefier VRM solution than you might see on some other motherboards where, you know, some motherboard designers have said, hey, look, those inner sill power stages are rated at 100 degrees C. We don't even really need to bother with cooling, it's fine. So with all that said about the, you know, stack situation on the VRM and how, oh, you know, is that, I think this is a perfectly fine motherboard for anything up to probably a 12 core. 12 cores may be pushing it a little bit if you're gonna do overclocking, but eight core, 10 core, six core, perfect. Six core I don't think is, is really good on X299 because you can get six cores on the you know the, the the mainstream platform now with coffee lake so really you're talking about the the eight core cpu the eight core cpu with this motherboard is basically ideal for two reasons one the eight core has a restricted number of pci express lanes so you're not going to be running a lot of peripherals anyway and power consumption now you can run the 10 and the 12 core it's totally fine like i say i ran the ran the 10 core overclocking was totally okay of course, the, uh, the one feature that we can't leave out of a motherboard, even a budget motherboard, is RGB. That's because it costs zero to install. Yeah, it's literally just software because there's general purpose I.O. pins on a motherboard, so it's not really a big deal to deal with that. It does also have a built-in M.2 slot for Wi-Fi, so you could add an M.2 Wi-Fi as well that goes through the chipset. Uh, it is optional, so you can get the motherboard with and without built-in Wi-Fi, no problem. In terms of the rear I.O. connections, 
The nicest thing about the rear I.O. connections of this motherboard is that it has separate PS2 and mouse ports. I still rock an IBM Model M myself, which is PS2. I don't use a PS2 input device like a mouse, but the PS2 keyboard, that's nice. There are also eight USB ports, two USB 2.0, one pair of USB 3.1 Gen 2, one Type-A, one Type-C, that's through an Asmedia add-in controller, and then four USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports on the back. We've also got our Realtek ALC 1220-based sort of premium audio codec, you know, again, middle of the road. The implementation for the sound codec is Purity Sound 4, so again, it's appropriate for a motherboard at this price point, but it does have optical SPDIF, so if you'd like to go out to an external digital to analog converter, you can do that through optical. USB, of course, is an option, and of course, the last connector at the rear I.O. is the clear CMOS button, so you can clear the CMOS sort of handily and conveniently. Now, even though the, the VRM power situation on this motherboard is a bit limited. It does have dual 8-pin connections. The second 8-pin connection is optional. You don't have to run with that, but you can, uh, especially if you have a, a lower wattage power supply, or maybe you want to ensure that you've got clean power delivery to your CPU, you know, maybe flat cables can't carry as much current or whatever. One single connector that can deliver 20 amps to this motherboard is all you need. If you're not sure that connector can deliver 20 amps to your motherboard, uh, you could use two, but again, like I say, entirely optional. In the motherboard box, it's pretty Spartan. You do, of course, get the trademark signature ASRock postcard. This is sort of the extreme postcard design. You also got a high-speed bridge. This is really cool because on a budget motherboard, I would expect that the bridge would not be included to save a few bucks. You gotta order it extra. Some premium motherboards don't even come with a high-speed bridge anymore. If you're gonna run dual graphics cards, the high-speed bridge, with the motherboard, the budget option is looking pretty good. This expansion slot card is for your wireless solution. So if you do decide to get an M.2 solution after the fact, they include this bracket so that you can mount your antennas up to a three antenna, three by three solution. If you are in an unfortunate position to require Wi-Fi for use on your desktop, my condolences, my heart goes out to you. But I would I would rather have this type of a solution where you can do your own add-in card because you can get an ultra premium three by three MIMO wireless card, which it would be impossible to find a motherboard bundled with a super high-end wireless card built in, unless the motherboard was, you know, north of $500. I like this option a lot better. You also got four SATA six gigabit per second cables, your rear IO shield, and some M.2 mounting accessories, three M.2 screws as well, because you get the two M.2 and then the other M.2 for the Wi-Fi. So total three, but really two usable for storage. So I don't wanna waste your time. I wanna to try to keep the motherboard reviews sort of as succinct as possible. You can see I've got it set up here on my test bench. We did go through the paces in Linux. Uh, I did actually try the KB Lake CPUs just to see how the four core CPU, the i5 would work. I used it for the BIOS tours. Also tested the 10 core in Linux. The IO MMU groups looked pretty good. If you were just gonna run a system with two graphics cards and other low speed peripherals, this would be a great motherboard. If you're gonna use a lot of peripherals, this motherboard's not gonna be appropriate. You might have the uh, graphics card and a high-speed add-in card using the armored slots. That would work fine. You could use a moderately high-speed uh, card, even like a Blackmagic capture card uh, or, you know, the Elgato gaming capture card, something like that. It's high speed. That would work fine off of the PCI Express by 4 chipset. If you're going to run some exotic card that's PCI Express by 8, you're pretty much relegated to only the other armored slot. But I think this is a perfectly fine, normal use case for most people. I think most people are not going to run tons and tons of peripherals. You also have the PCI Express by one slots, so it's not really a big deal. I think if I were gonna, you know, outfit an office with custom X299 machines, you know, eight core, 10 core, this would probably be the economical choice for the motherboard. It's got a good set of features. They really didn't skimp too much on the important stuff. The limitations of the VRM are pretty well documented. I think that as long as you've got sufficient airflow in your case, it's not gonna shorten the lifetime of your components, especially if you're not going for that extreme overclock. So all in all, I think this motherboard is sensible. Sensible is probably the best way to describe it. It's got RGB, you can turn RGB off, but it's a really sensible, it's surprisingly sensible for the price point. I was really trying to find something wrong with it, but other than, you know, it's like, this is what we did to save money, which we're upfront about. Uh, there's not really anything else that I can, I can find fault with. So while you do have eight SATA ports at the front for a huge number of SATA devices, you don't have things like U.2, you don't have things like the front panel USB 3.1 Gen 2, you know, all of these things are things that have been uh, dropped in order to keep the cost low. But the features that are here are the features that, that most people would need. There's, there's everything you need and nothing that you don't. Um, and so it's not premium, but it's not a bad motherboard either. I think that it's a, a very sensible motherboard, especially if you're gonna go for the eight core, maybe the 10 core. The, the 10 core at $1,000, I think is just a little bit 
asking a little bit much for this for this platform for for, for what you get um, basically in my testing it worked really well i really didn't have any problem hitting five gigahertz on the 10 core like i've said uh, the Linux support was pretty good. I didn't have any trouble with Linux I'm using Fedora 27 as my test kernel. And it's got the sort of bog standard ASRock UEFI that has all of the options, multi-core enhancement that you can turn on and you know sort of get the automatic super almost guaranteed overclock that's not really an overclock but kind of is an overclock. Um, and so we can go on a full tour of the UEFI at the end of the video and we can check out the IOMMU groups at the end of the video. But all in all, this is the best value for the X299 platform. Um, I think this would be, like if I were gonna build a low cost budget X299 system around the eight core, this motherboard would, would probably be a good choice at the price point, so. So take that for what you will. Hasrock continues to impress, both with features on some of their higher end boards and value on boards like this one. I noticed also it said made in Vietnam on the box, so interesting. Interesting manufacturing afoot. I don't know. If you picked up one of these boards and you want to share photos of your rigs, do join us in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out, and I'll see you there. but only at 25 degrees C. At 100 degrees C, which is 